Hello and welcome back to EIU where we round up the biggest talking points and results from around Europe. And joining me today, it's a very cold Patrick Van Straten it's in cold. this icy studio. You know what I've discovered? What have uh, you discovered? When I was, when I was fatter, I was warmer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really... Is that actually a thing? Well, I don't know, but I was saying to my wife the other day, I was like, Jesus, I'm really cold. And she was just like, have you considered that you... You were just wearing like An basically a, a padded coat <laughs> for the last few years, and I was like, Sh "Yeah, maybe that's it." Uh, yeah. But I could be dying. Let's not rule that out. Let's do some big feeds this month then, with the uh, beast from the east incoming. Anyway, let's start with Erling brought Holland. Uh, comes in from at Joe D Shepherd. Yeah, he had pretty much the ideal debut, which is kind of his calling card at this point. Now, Dortmund were three-one down when he came on mm. against Augsburg away from home. But he scored with his first touch of the game and ended up with a hat-trick. Now, this ridiculous scoreline obviously should be no surprise to anybody. 5-3. The Bundesliga is generally the highest scoring division in Europe. And with 3.22 goals per game this season, it is sticking with that trend. Mm. Um, Haaland got his first Bundesliga strike just 183 seconds after coming on as a sub. 20 minutes later, he had a hat-trick. Uh, he's the first debutant to do so for the club since Aubameyang in 2013. Good company to keep. Also against Augsburg. <laughs> Poor old Augsburg. Yes, yeah, so they're a team you want to play on your debut. Now, um, they were sort of asking for it. Playing a pretty high line. And you'd imagine that being more of a problem against Aubameyang than mm. against Haaland. But he well, was Haaland able... Haaland is pretty quick. Yeah, but he's more... He's not like... Lights out fast. Yeah, he's not like running away from everybody, but the combination of speed and strength with him is such a problem, mm. right? And in this game, it was just clinical. 14 touches of the ball, three shots on target, three goals. In all competitions this season, he now has 31 goals in 22 games. Absolutely ridiculous. And 31 that, in 22, dude. It, it's crazy. And if you can keep it going, now he's in a much harder division. Obviously, he's shone in the Champions League as well. I think only Lewandowski has scored more goals than him. Then he's got to be talked about as one of the, you know, the best strikers in the world if he continues this current run of form going. Are you not um, absolutely delighted he didn't go to Man United? Oh, I think it's fantastic news. <laughs> I think it's so good for, so good for the Premier League. It's so good for him. He can come in two or three years' time and absolutely smash it up. Yeah, but agreed. He'd be seen as an absolute savior at United. It would have been the worst career move of all time. Um, but what, <laughs> wow. what we're sort of discussing on this show is whether it puts Dortmund in the title mix. I feel like seven points is a pretty big gap to a side of, of the strength of Leipzig as well. So I'm not sure whether it necessarily does, um, but what a start. And he was ably assisted by Jadon Sancho again, uh, putting in a monstrous performance. The Englishman grabbed a goal and an assist, but also created seven chances, a match high, and completed three dribbles. Only Julian Brandt managed more. He's had a great last six weeks or so, Julian Brandt. But Sancho, ridiculous form right now, scoring nine and assisting six in his last nine appearances at club level in all competitions. Uh, and it's hard to say it was an undeserved victory on the night. Dortmund had an XG of 3.6 to Augsburg's 1.8, with 70% possession and eight shots on target to the home side's five. Uh, this result now sees Dortmund seven points adrift in the table, as I mentioned. And with Cologne and Union Berlin up next, there must wins to remain in the top four, let alone in the title hunt. Uh, as for Augsburg, they remain in mid-table, and the only positive thing to come out of the game for them was that Richter scored the fourth fastest goal after halftime since Opta Records began. Uh, very niche stuff there. Um, Pat, I see some people on Twitter saying that Dortmund need to get rid of Lucien Favre. Do you think that the defensive deficiencies of this side need a new coach in charge? Um, I do think in the long term, I've never really been a Favre fan, mm. so I do think in the long term I would look for an upgrade, but I certainly don't think he's doing badly enough that you'd sack him now. I think things are absolutely fine. Look in the summer when there'll be guys available who can really improve you. You know, if Marco Rosa is willing to move on in the summer, I think, or, or even, you know, maybe think about bringing about Hassan Hussle. Like, mm. there are going to be guys around in the summer, so I don't think there's any rush there. I, I personally don't think they ever shot the title at all. No, it's too far gone. Although, I saw some people on Twitter saying that this is the first time they've had an out-and-out nine since the Birmingham, because obviously Paco Alcacer is more of a, well, I was going to say more of a false nine, but actually he spends a lot of the time in the box. But basically an effective lights out number nine. So maybe it could get them in the back of the mix. But Dortmund fans, we want to know from you. Would you keep Favre uh, to the end of the year or um, make a change now and potentially push for a title with your new superstar striker? Let us know in the comments down below. And let's move on to our first loser. Our first losers of the week are Inter Milan. This comes from at 6FTLA. 
S, uh, I actually don't know what happened to them. What did? What did? They they drew away at Lecce, Ooh. which cannot happen if you want to win a title, uh, especially with a Juventus winning against Parma. Um, the best chances of the first half all fell to Brozovic, uh, who first struck the post. He didn't just strike the post, he absolutely battered it against the post uh, before forcing a double save from Gabriel with two close range efforts. Uh, Inter took a deserved lead on the 70, 71st minute, sorry, when Bastoni headed home Baraghi's cross. Uh, but they were pegged back as captain Marco Moncosu poked home his sixth goal of the season. He is Lecce's top scorer of this campaign. Was very emotional afterwards. Was a lot of tears coming out of his face. Um, but, you know, deservedly so. Well, I mean, he out of scored a crucial goal. Uh, and then the Salatini almost snatched all three points as Falco's late free kick hit the outside of the post. Um, that's two draws in a row now for Antonio Conte's side and just two wins in their last five as they fall four points behind Maurizio Sarri's men. Uh -oh. And that feels like quite a big gap to Juventus with them being so consistent uh, this season. But Pat, they were probably a bit unfortunate not to get the win here. Yeah, I mean, 66% of the ball, 24 shots, nine on target, an XG of 1.8. I mean, you do expect that to get the job done. You know, whereas you look at, say, the Napoli game, where actually on XG they were significantly worse and ran out 3-1 winners, and it just feels a little bit all over the shop mm. at the moment. I mean, Lecce goalkeeper Gabriel was the man of the match. He made eight saves in the 90 minutes, and sometimes that just happens, you know? Think about that Atalanta game last season, you know, where they had, what was it, 40-odd yeah. shots, and it was nil-nil. Sometimes these things do happen. Um, it's just that when the title race is this tight, you can't afford for those things to happen. And Lautaro Martinez, was getting on the end of everything. I mean, he had nine shots, got four on target, but obviously just couldn't really make a breakthrough. However, we've got to give credit to Brozovic. As you said, he was a real goal threat on the day and 93 completed passes in the match. That's almost triple any Lecce player. Three chances created and three shots. What, what a performance. Yeah, I mean, he's been fantastic this season and he is going to be crucial if Inter are able to claw back Juventus. Four points down, could slip to third if Lazio win their game in hand. Oh, uh -oh. I'm, I've got to be honest, I was surprised that they were doing as well as they were for so long. And don't get me wrong, it's still possible they win the league. It absolutely is. But you look at the strength of Juve's squad and it just feels like that's going to be the difference down the stretch. I mean, they've still got that game against Juve to play. So obviously that could claw back three points as well. True. But, you know, judging on that performance in their first game where Juventus, I think it was 2-1, but Juventus were very much on top of that yeah, game. Yeah, they're really comfortable. And, Juventus, and Inter have struggled in the bigger games in the Champions League. So maybe the... Less of a big, big, um, big game players this this season anyway, but hopefully it's not done and dusted. I'm enjoying this title race. Yeah, well, they they can obviously hope as well that Juve like maybe get locked into a difficult situation in the Champions League if they True. were somehow to get through. Um, whereas Inter now being down in the Europa can kind of afford to play the kids. So who knows? We will see. But what do you guys think? Who will end up winning the Italian title? Let us know in the comments below. Our second winner is Schalke, and this comes in from at Sebastian Hard zero one Pat. Yeah, Schalke had drawn two on the bounce, but managed to get back to winning ways, surprisingly, against Marco Rosa's Borussia Mönchengladbach what at result? the Veltins Arena, beating them 2-0 with goals from midfielder Stuart Serdar, his seventh in 14 starts. Love it. And debutant Michael Gregorich, who arrived in the winter window from Augsburg. Now, 25-year-old, quite an interesting character, has already played for seven clubs, okay. uh, including three extended stints in reserve sides. And he actually only featured in six games for his parent club this season. About 300 minutes. Expected goals and assists of about 0 0.18 per 90. Okay, so not having the not best the, year. Not the most obvious signing no. for Schalke. Um, but anyway, a couple of years ago, he did actually get 15 in 30. And so clearly Schalke think, okay, well, if we can get him back to that form then we might get something out of him. And on the evidence of this game, maybe David Wagner will be able to. He had five shots with four inside the box, won six aerial duels, had four key passes, one goal, one assist, and a goal line clearance. Love it, busy guy. That's an outrageous debut. <laughs> um, and it was gonna require a special performance to breach Gladbach. They'd only conceded 18 goals. That's a league leading figure prior to this match. So well done to Gregorich, um, but really, a weird one from Gladbach. Yeah, I mean, their form has been a bit stuttering of late. They've only got two wins in their last five, but they did start okay here. Um, so, Alison Play uh, came close early on with his effort being tipped narrowly over by Schubert. And despite registering another four efforts on targets, that's as close as he came, uh, with four of his five shots coming from outside the box. 
Uh, in fact, the Frenchman's five efforts only yielded an XG of 0.21, according to Understat. And after starting the season in fine form, he now only has two goals, uh, two goal involvement, sorry, in his last 10 games for Gladbachs in all competitions. Uh, and I thought that actually, from the look at the highlights, I didn't actually watch the whole game, um, Gladbach's high line was being caught out a lot, uh, with a lot of quick counters from Wagner's men. Uh, so it, they probably had it coming, uh, as it were. Patrick Herman probably came closest for the visitors. Uh, Zakaria also put in six tackles and inceptions. Uh, but truth is that the home side, as I said, probably deserved it. Jan Sommer had already had to make three saves by the 20th minute, and one save with his foot was absolutely exceptional. Uh, XG had it at 2 to 0.8 in Dinappen's favour. So fair play to Schalke. What a fantastic result. And up to fourth in the Bundesliga. Uh, so what result? How far do you guys think you can go this season? And will you finish in the top four Schalke fans? Let me know in the comments down below. And let's move on to our final loser. We return to Italy for our second and final losers of the week. It's at Jamalera's suggestion, Napoli. My God, are they bad. Yeah, they are not playing well at all at the moment under Gattuso. Uh, they lost 2-0 at home to Fiorentina. That's their fourth loss in five games under the Italian. Uh, Federico Chiesa and Dusan Valovic scored either side of half-time in a game short on goal-scoring chances, with 10 shots on target between the two teams, but only a 1.4 XG combined. Uh, Napoli have taken six points from, 18, from a possible 18 since Gattuso took over, scoring six and conceding nine. It feels like the players just didn't really want Ancelotti to be fired because they're just not responding well to Gattuso's methods at all. And the mayor report that the 42-year-old is considering resigning after just 36 days in charge, with the results poor and his coaching decisions, like dropping Alex Mere and moving Gianna, Giovanni Di Lorenzo to centre-back, widely panned. Obviously, Di Lorenzo is no normally a right-back. Mm. Uh, he named a strong side here, though, uh, with Alan, Rui, Zielinski in midfield and Callahan, Milliken and Senior in attack. Probably close to their you know, first choice midfield and attack. And though they had a massive possession proportion of 67%, Fiorentina had more shots in the box, 8-6, to six, and shots on target, 6-4. to four. Uh, That midfield won possession just once combined, Fabian Ruiz making a single tackle. So Alan normally pretty good on that front, Zielinski as well, just not doing the business whatsoever. Um, Pat, but in contrast, Fiorentina going through a bit of a good moment. Yeah, they're having a good spot. They just brought in Patrick Catrone mm. uh, on loan with an option. No, I think it's an obligation to buy. And this was his full debut for the club. They actually didn't manage to have a single shot. Um, not particularly good. Uh, but they've recorded successive league victories for the first time six, since October 6th. And this win means that coach Giuseppe Iacchini, who was appointed just before Christmas to replace Montella after that 4-1 loss to Roma, mm. I think, he has three wins and a draw in his first four matches as Viola coach. Uh, the 55-year-old had previously played for the club. He's been managing since 2002. He's had 14 managerial spells in that time, but he's he only died? overseen more than 100 games at a single club once. Right, okay. So he moves is, around a lot. He gets sacked a lot, yeah. I think. Um, his career win percentage, 39%. That's not great. It's not great, but you know what's worse? Gattuso's 38%. Really? Unbelievable. It's incredibly bad, and it's likely to get worse because next up for Napoli, they've got Lazio in the Coppa Italia, who obviously are in sparkling form, and then they've got a trip away to Juventus. Blimey, so it could truly be a sort of 45-day stint for it, Gattuso. It's genuinely awful. Um, but in a way, maybe just having it go horrifically badly is not the worst thing for you. For Napoli because I don't think it was ever the right appointment so maybe then they can just move on as swiftly as possible. Try and forget it, erase it from the history books. Our star of the week is Casemiro and this comes in from at KevinX21, Pat. Yeah, uh, narrowly beating out Chiro Mobile. Yeah. We had a few shouts for him. He got a hat-trick against Samp. He's now the top scorer in Europe's top five leagues with 23 goals in 19 games. Better goals per minute ratio than Robert Lewandowski but we got even more shouts for Casemiro who scored an unlikely brace to secure three vital points for Real Madrid versus Sevilla. Now, they had to wait for the second half for the breakthrough at the Bernabeu. Uh, in the first period, they were outshot five to four, and it was, okay. unsurprisingly, you know, you're not really going to see goals if there are that few shots in mm. a game. Uh, it seemed like they kind of were cancelled out by their former coach, Lopetegui. But Casemiro opened the scoring with a nice, dinked finish on 57 minutes. Lovely back heel assist from Luka Jovic. It'd be good to see him come into some form over the back half of the season. Say that again. And he headed the winner 12 minutes later following Luke de Jong's equaliser. Take his tally for the season to four. <laughs> Whoa. 
Uh, just as well he was on scoring form, actually. Um, of Madrid's starting front three, only Luka Jovic managed a single shot, while Casemiro and Toni Kroos had, a, had actually four each. Love it. The well, most on the pitch. So it was a game where the midfield made the difference and Casemiro did it on this occasion. Yeah, definitely. And he was pretty sound defensively, as you'd expect, from probably you know one of the top two or three defensive midfielders in the world. Uh, no one on the field matched his five successful tackles or seven defensive actions. In what was a tight affair, Real Madrid edged possession sorry, with 52%. While Barcelona took back the top spot on goal difference after their victory over Granada to that Lionel Messi goal, uh, Real's excellent defensive record gives them just as much title credentials as their rivals. Uh, Zidane's side have conceded just 13 goals, less than any other side in La Liga, and unsurprisingly, Casemiro has been essential to this. Only Karim Benzema has played more minutes than him in the league, and he leads the squad in both tackles and interceptions. What another fantastic year from Casemiro. What a signing as well from Porto, really underrated at the time. Uh, in fact, Casemiro's six defensive actions a, a, a match is better than anyone else in the Spanish top flight, and he will need to keep this fine form going, as Real Madrid have a big month ahead of them, starting with a visit of Atleti in two weeks' time, and then two clashes against City in the Champions League, which should be absolutely Are we going to cover those? Are we going to live stream those? We please? are live streaming one of them. Whoa. And also Whoa. looking to do Atleti Liverpool, depending on availability mm. as well. Probably, um, I wouldn't watch that one. But Real Madrid City will be absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Pat, if you had to say now, who do you think is going through in that tie? Mm. Both have their deficiencies, City. both have their strengths. City. I think, yeah. I don't think Madrid are that great. Yeah, but City do ship a lot of goals compared to usual at least. Yeah. Another two against Crystal Palace of the weekend. But do we think that Pep can stop Benzema? Yeah, you'd, have, you'd I, hope I so. I think so. Although John Stones does desperately need to get back his form ahead of the Euros as well. So it's going to be absolutely fascinating. But guys, who do you guys think is going to win between Real Madrid and Man City? Why don't you vote in the poll above? Haven't put a poll in the RU for quite a little while. And uh, that's all we've got time for on ERU for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Let us know what you guys thought of the show in the comments section down below. Uh, Pat, what should they go and do now? Uh, check out the podcast uh, from the weekend where we looked at transfer needs of some of Europe's biggest clubs and head over to Football Daily to watch winners and losers if you want to see a Premier League-centric version of this same thing. Nice. Thanks, guys.